Welcome to our lesson on solving equations. You'll see that we're going to look at four major equation types. Linear equations, and then different versions of linear equations. Rational equations, which are really just a specialized version of linear equations that involve fractions. And after a few steps, they end up becoming linear equations. Quadratic equations, and those are the biggies. We're going to do a lot with those uh, in the future. And then last but not least, some radical equations, things that inv involve uh, roots. Okay, let's start with just some basic vocabulary, right? An equation is just something that has two things on each side of an equal sign. And we solve the one variable by finding all solutions that make that equation true. Linear equation, which is what you should be familiar with already, is something that takes the form of a straight line if you graph it and you'll normally see them written in this form ax plus b equals zero of course you're used to maybe y equals mx plus b you can see how that's the same thing just make that an a right and then make that a number in this case zero and you have a linear equation Quadratic equations, and this is a, a typo, there should be a little square there, is of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. That's the general form of a quadratic. Where a, b, and c are always going to be real numbers, and a can't be 0 in both cases, because if a was 0 in the first case, you would just have b equals 0. And of course, that's just silly. It's not really much, just b equals 0. And then if a equals 0 here, then you get bx plus c, and we're back to a linear equation, right? So that's why they can't be 0. Okay, some of the legal things, right, the, the, the steps we can do when trying to solve these things. We can always add something to both sides of an equation, and it's still equal. And then we can also subtract something. We can multiply something on both sides, and we can also divide both sides by the same thing. We try not to, to multiply by 0, because that tends to just cancel things out and we of course can never multiply or divide by zero. Um, once we've moved things around we have the uh, what's called the zero product principle or principle of zero products. And all that tells us is that if we have um, two things being multiplied together A and B down here if we have the product of a and b equaling 0, then we know one of them or both of them has to be equal to 0. This rule tells it in, in two directions, right? If we know their product is 0, then we know one or both of them is equal to 0. And conversely, if we know one or both of them is 0, then we know their product is 0. It's kind of an if and only if uh, idea. And then the the other thing is, not only can we add, subtract, multiply, and divide both sides, but we can also uh, square both sides or take the square root of both sides, and things are still equivalent. We just have to worry about introducing um, possible uh, extra answers. For instance, um, if we have x equals 4, right? Square both sides. Now we have x squared equals 16. Well, now when we look at this, there are two solutions, 4 and negative 4. But the original one could only be 4. So you always have to be careful whenever you're taking uh, square roots or squaring things that you might introduce uh, extra solutions when you square, and you might get rid of solutions when you take a square root. Because if we now start with this, this is our original equation, now we take the square root of both sides and we get x equals 4, right? You forget, you might forget, that in the original equation we also could have had negative 4, okay? So anytime you take square roots or, or squares, you always got to remember there's a possibility of losing a solution or introducing a false solution. Here's some examples of these properties, right? If we have um, 8x equals 2 times this, well then we can distribute it, it's still the same. We can move the 4x over, it's still the same. We can divide both sides by 12, and it's still the same as far as it, that it's still equal. And then we're finally left with our solution that x equals 3. 
Over here is this idea of the zero product. You take this, move the 16 over, you get something that's quadratic. You factor it. Now you know that either the first factor equals zero or the second factor equals zero, which they end up being the same thing. And when you solve each of those, you get that x equals four. Okay, let's look more closely at a linear equation. We've already talked about the things we can do. Um, we can add, subtract, multiply, divide, right? We can get rid of grouping symbols, i.e. parentheses. We can combine like terms. All these types of things we can do and we still have equivalent equations. So with that in mind, if we put together a simple set of four steps that will help us solve any linear equation. Firstly, you want to simplify the expressions on each side. And really what that means is you just want to get rid of fractions, decimals, and parentheses, things like that. Let's say we have a simple linear equation like uh, 2 times x minus 3 plus 1 half equals uh, 3 minus 5 times x minus 2 plus 1 fourth. Now on the surface that might seem very scary and a lot of stuff is going on, but if we just tackle our steps, it's pretty easy. Okay, we want to get rid of fractions, decimals, parentheses, grouping, symbols, right? Things that are sticking things together because we know eventually we want to get all the x's alone and all the numbers alone. And so, you know, these things are stuck together. That x and that 2 are stuck together. And that's why we're doing those types of uh, things in these steps. So let's go ahead and distribute. 2x minus 6 plus 1 half, 3 minus 5x plus 10. Did you remember that so minus, this is a minus 5 times everything, so minus 5 times minus 2. Okay, looks a little better. Now, get rid of fractions. Well, how do we get rid of fractions? Well, the easiest way to get rid of fractions is to just multiply through by um, what you have. But it might also be better to combine like terms first, right? We can actually, we don't have to always do these steps in order. They normally work in this order, but uh, one and two can kind of work together. So let's combine some things if we can just to simplify our life. And now we have uh, 2x minus 6 plus a half equals 13, right, minus 5x plus 1 fourth. Put the 3 and the 10 together. Now if I want to get rid of a half and a fourth, the easiest thing to do is just multiply everything by 4. 8x minus 24. 1 fourth times a half is 2. 13 times 4. 52, and then minus 20x plus 1. Now we can go back to step 2 again, combining like terms on both sides. 8x minus 22 equals 53 minus 20x. Then we want to isolate the variable of interest. The reason why I put variable of interest instead of just variable is sometimes you'll have to deal with these things with more than one variable. Right now we only have one, so that's our variable of interest. Okay, we want to get all the variables on one side, all the numbers on the other side. Now I know you guys have been trained through years of math to always put the variable on the left and the number on the right. You don't have to do that. What you really should be doing is keeping your variable positive because later we're going to deal with inequalities and you want to keep your variable positive because it will lessen the chance of you making a mistake. So my advice, keep the variable positive. So you can either subtract 8x over here and they get a negative, or you can add 20x to the left, which is what you probably want to do anyhow. But just know that the reason why I'm going to move the 20 over here is not to put it on the left, but to keep it positive. 28x, right, because I add 20 to both sides. Then I add 22 to both sides, and I get 70 
Then all I have to do is divide both sides by 28, and x equals 75 over 28. And then I'd want to reduce that if I could. But 78 is uh, just 7 times 4, and 75 is not divisible by 7s or 4s or 2s, right? Because 4 is 2 times 2. So that would be my answer. The last thing I'd want to do is check it by plugging it back into the original equation. We're not going to spend the time doing that because it's kind of ugly since our answer was a fraction. But you can now see a simple example of, of how this these four steps work. Here's another example. First thing we do is distribute. Then we combine like terms. Then we isolate the variable by bringing the 6x over so it remains positive. Move the 4 over the other side. Now we've got 2x equals 10. Divide both sides by 2 and x equals 5. And then of course we'd want to check it to make sure it was correct. So we go back and put 5 in the original equation and we do in fact get that it works. Okay, how about if we have another one with fractions? Just like I said, get rid of fractions, decimals, parentheses, things like that. So just multiply through by, you know, you can try and find the least common denominator and multiply by 28 if you want, or you can just go, oh, well, I'm going to pick the biggest number, I'm going to multiply through by 14, that's going to kill off whatever it's going to kill off fraction-wise, and if anything's left, I'm going to come back and multiply by whatever's left. So you could do this in two steps. You wouldn't have to spend the brain power trying to figure out that 28 is your least uh, common denominator. But in any case, once you get rid of those fractions, you now have this, and you're right back to solving those simple linear equations that we've already seen a couple of. And that's the beauty of math, is if you can learn little simple techniques to get a complicated question looking like a simpler one, then it's back to something you already know how to solve. Here it is just uh, finishing that uh, those steps up, getting that x equals 1, plugging it back in, and verifying that it does in fact work. All right, so now that we know how to solve these linear equations that have fractions in them, it's a logical step to bump it up a notch and make it seem a little bit more difficult. It really isn't, but it might look initially more difficult by moving up to what are called rational equations, just a fancy word for fractions that have variables in the denominator. Let's look at this example. First, we factor it out, and the only reason why we factor it out is so that we know what the least common denominator is, so we can go ahead and get rid of those fractions, decimals, and parentheses, in this case fractions, by multiplying through by all of those denominators. Luckily for us, they set this one up so that the right-hand side was just made up of the pieces on the left. So if we multiply everything through by x plus 3 and x minus 2, it'll kill off all those fractions all at once, which is what we do here. Multiply both sides of the equation by that product of x plus 3 and x minus 2, and it will get rid of each fraction as we go. When we distribute this through and take this whole piece and multiply it by this first fraction, these will cancel and what will be left is this, right? When we do it on the second piece here, these cancel and this is left. And then of course on the right hand side everything cancels and you just have negative 20. And now once again we're right back to a simple linear equation that we already know how to solve. Get rid of parentheses by distributing to, through, making sure not to mess up that we're distributing a minus 5 here, right? which is why this is a minus sign here. Combine like terms, add it to the other side to isolate our variable, and there's our solution. We would want to plug it back in and verify that it was correct. Okay, let's move on to quadratic. The more important of the two, the one that you're going to see a lot of, Anything that looks like this, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero is a quadratic. And in fact, there's going to be a lot of things that look slightly different from this that you just move some stuff around and it ends up looking like this. Remind ourselves of the zero product principle because this is what we're going to need to solve a quadratic. We know that if a product of two things equals zero, then one or the other or both equals zero. Okay, how do we solve a quadratic? Well, 
if it's in this general form of ax squared plus bx plus c, then, or if it's not in that form, what you do is you move the constants all over to one side so that you're left with nothing but a zero on the other side so that it is in that form. Then you factor it if you can and then apply the zero product principle setting each factor equal to zero and then solve each of those and then check your solutions. Very simple. Let's look at an example. We start off with 2x squared plus x equals 1. It's not equal to 0, so what do we do? We move the 1 over to the other side. Now it's equal to 0. Now we can try and factor. Now if you're sitting here thinking, I don't know how to factor these things, there's no way I would have seen how to factor that. That's OK. It'll come with practice. Um, if you can't factor, you can always use the quadratic formula, which we'll talk about here in a second. So there's other ways to um, skin the proverbial cat if you don't know how to factor. But I do recommend practicing factoring because it will save you a lot of time and it is a necessary skill. Once we have it factored, we now set each of those factors equal to zero, solve for them, get our two solutions of one half and negative one, plug those back into the original equation and just verify that they do in fact work. For quadratics, they'll almost always work if they're in the general form. If they're not in the general form, that's where you have to really worry. And that's what brings us to the square root property. If we have something in this form, u squared equals d, or really if you want to relate it back um, to the other one, instead of ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, you're looking for something of the form of just something squared equals a constant. right? So this could be x, or it could be ax, but if the whole thing's squared, then you're going to have this a has to be a, uh, a square number. It doesn't really have to be. But you get the idea. It's just one thing being squared. In essence, you're missing this extra piece, right? If you have a squared term and a constant, but you don't have this, then you're thinking square root property. Remind yourself that if you have u squared equals d, when you take the square root of both sides, you have to remember that you have the positive and the negative version, right? which is what they mean by plus or minus. Here's an example. You look at this and go, hey, look, this looks just like ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. In this case, a equals 3, c equals negative 21 but b equals 0. It's gone, right? I told you whenever you're missing that bx piece, that's when you're thinking the square root principle. You move the 21 to the other side, you divide by 3, take the square root, remembering that it's plus or minus, which gives you two solutions. You check them both and verify that they both work or not, right? In this case, they both work. Completing the square. Oh, everybody hates completing the square. It's actually not nearly as bad as you think it is. Um, it is, however, um, a technique that a lot of students make mistakes, so I would recommend only using this as a last-ditch effort. If you're, if you're specifically asked to complete the square or whenever you need to graph a quadratic and you're not allowed to use a graphing calculator or something like that, completing the square really helps you um, graph a quadratic. Uh, that's really its best. Um, most useful application. Okay, so if you have this piece here and you take half of b and square it, you've now created this perfect square. And that's what it means by completing the square. You've completed it by adding that piece and you've made something that is now a perfect square. Let's look at it in, um, in action. Okay, so here's our quadratic. We're trying to solve it. We don't want to try factoring. I don't know why. That would be the first thing I would try. Um, so we're going to do it by completing the square, probably because we need to graph or you know something like that. First step is to isolate those two pieces. You want these two pieces all by themselves and just move the constant over to the other side. OK, now that you have these two, you just need to add in that b over 2 squared piece, right? So you take b which is simply 4. Take half of it, which is 2, and you square it, and you add that to both sides. 
So this is just 2 squared, which is 4. 4 plus 1 is 5. That's where that comes from. They skipped a step here. Um, you know, on the left-hand side, you end up getting x squared plus 4x plus, remember this is 2 squared, which is 4. And now this always becomes x plus the square root of this number squared. It basically is this number, right? Because here it is squared, and then we're going to take its square root. And that's where this comes from. And then you can now take the square root of both sides and get x plus 2 on the left plus or minus square root of 5 on the right. Move the 2 over, right? And then here is your solution. Now you might be thinking, well, couldn't I have just taken this and plugged it into the quadratic formula? Absolutely, you could have, and you would have gotten the exact same answer. But maybe you needed to do this uh, for graphing, and it's easier to graph this thing from this line here. If you write your quadratic as x plus 2 quantity squared minus 5 equals 0, this now becomes really easy to graph. Okay, so that's going to be the number one way we're going to use this later. Last but not least, the quadratic formula. We've already mentioned it. Here it is formally. Right, we're back to the general form, ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. Of course, a still can't equal 0, or otherwise we wouldn't have a quadratic. And if we have something in that form, then we just use this formula to find the solutions. And this plus or minus is where you normally get two answers. You don't have to get two. Sometimes you get one. Sometimes you get two. In fact, sometimes you get none. But that's how you get two when there are two solutions. Here's a simple example with this as our quadratic in general form. We can see that a equals 2, b equals 2, and c equals negative 1. You plug all those in, do the math, and you end up getting this very ugly solution. And oftentimes that's what you will get, things involving radicals. You won't get pretty nice whole numbers. Okay, how do we know the best way to solve a quadratic? Well, it's pretty simple. If you're faced with something that looks like something squared and a constant, then you have to use the square root method. So remember, that's something that looks like you know, 2x squared plus 5 equals 0 that's going to use the square root method because we're missing, right, any time, this basically says any time we're missing that bx piece, right, the ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, whenever you're missing that bx piece, that's when you're going to use the square root method. Any other time, as long as you have something that looks like this, right, or, you know, if the constants over here and you move it over there then all of a sudden it looks like this. So anything that's what we're going to call quadratic in form, then you have three ways to do it. You can factor, you can use the quadratic formula, or you can complete the square. My advice is always try to factor first. It gives you the quickest, simplest answers. It gives you answers that are nice, pretty numbers. Um, if it can't factor, then I would move on to the quadratic formula because it's very easy to do and I would do completing the square last. The only time I would complete the square is if I have to either A, graph my quadrat quadratic, or B, I've been asked specifically to solve this one using the completing the square method. Otherwise, in my opinion, it's a distance third, unless you're really good at it. Some people are really good at it, then you can always use it. Okay, so, so that's it. That's how you know when to use which. It's pretty simple. Let's move on to radicals. A radical equation is just something that involves a root, a square root or anything, cube root, whatever power, doesn't matter. To solve roots, all you need to do is isolate the radical on one side of the equation and then raise both sides of the equation to whatever power is necessary to undo that root. Then you solve the resulting equation unless 
there's still a root left somewhere in the equa in the equation and then you do it over and over and over again until all the radicals are gone and this can actually happen you can have uh, you know two radicals one on each side you raise it to one power to, to get rid of one radical the other one's still there so you raise it to whatever is left over to get rid of that one and then you finally have no radicals on either side here's a simple example right the first thing we have to do is isolate that radical so we move the three to the other side because it's a square root we square both sides if it was a cube root we would that's right, cube both sides. If it was a fifth root, we'd raise both sides to the power of five, and so on and so on. You get the idea. Okay, now that we've gotten rid of the radicals, we're really back to either solving a linear or solving a quadratic based on what we have. In this case, we have a quadratic, right? You can see an x squared term there. You can see an x term there. You can see a constant. You can see some other stuff. When you move it all onto one side and set it equal to zero, you have ax squared plus bx plus c. You've got a quadratic. First thing we always try is to factor, in case this one does factor. Lovely, easy. Take each of those factors, set them equal to zero, solve. We get two solutions, six and one. But remember, what did I tell you? Anytime you square something, right, an equation on both sides, you have the possibility of introducing a false solution. So you always have to check these. Check six. In the original equation, plug it in, it works. Check one. In the original equation, you plug it in and it does not work, right? So there you have it. There's the example of something that came out algebraically but doesn't actually work in the original equation. So you had to check it and you had to see that the only solution was 6. 1 ended up being this extraneous solution, i.e. an extra solution that we introduced into the equation when we squared it. Okay, those are all the basics that we need for solving equations.